I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. And if you are under the age of 50, scroll with me on your phones in your favorite Bible app. We'll be picking up in verse 33. Acts 27, verses 33 to 38. And if you are able, let me invite you to stand with me out of reverence for God's word. Acts 27, verses 33 to 38. This is the word of God. It is always true. Luke writes, until the day was about to dawn, Paul was encouraging them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you've been constantly watching, going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation, for not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. Having said this, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. And he broke it and began to eat. All of them were encouraged and they themselves also took food. All of us in the ship were 276 persons. When they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. of your spirit, would you bear the fruit of your spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue our series in Acts, we've spent a number of weeks on this lengthy chapter. We're coming quickly to the end of not only this account of Paul's impending shipwreck, but the book of Acts itself. I think you'll find chapter 28 goes by pretty quickly, uh, which Luke, I believe, treats in summary fashion. I'll make a few brief comments. I will then seek to briefly deal with what some consider to be a theological problem in this text, and then I will seek to briefly exhort you. Now, I did promise Matt I would get you out here no later than 2.45. So... <laughs> If you start to get restless around 2.30, just let me know. In, in all seriousness, um, I was surprised. This is not in my notes. so just uh, I read a book years ago about the practice of some Puritans who thought it propitious to schedule days of thanksgiving and prayer from time to time. Uh, that's one of the influences on our current practice in the New World for those nations that were influenced by Northern Europe and its Protestantism <clears throat> to have a day of Thanksgiving. And in one description of that, uh, of one typical day, one of the Puritans, whose name escapes me, mentioned that they would gather at something like, I don't know, 6 a.m. And then one of the pastors, and it would be a community, this would be for a community, whole town so multiple congregations are involved here and they would pack out the little church and then one pastor would get up and pray lead, lead in a public prayer for about an hour and then get up and then there would sit down and there'd be another pastor that would get up and give an extemporaneous exhortation from the scriptures for a couple of hours and then someone else would stand up and lead for about half an hour, and then they would invite people to pray, stand up and pray extemporaneously for two or three hours, and then they would break for lunch, and then come back, and then someone else would stand up and pray for an hour or two, and then lead other people. I'm, I'm not making up any of this. This is not hyperbole at all. 
Now, so just be grateful that I'm not. <laughs> All right. Uh, a few brief comments. Uh, verse 33. Uh, the, the, the verb structure there in verse 3 indicates that uh, Paul didn't just do this once, but Paul was busy about the ship encouraging others. It was a continual action in view there. Uh, notice they've been without four, uh, one of the verbs, excuse me, adjectives in verse 33 indicates that um, they're not eating uh, was not because they didn't have food available, but because they were unable or unwilling to eat of it, either because of the logistical complications uh, to serve because of the storm or because everyone was simply too nervous to eat. Um, verse 34 uh, there's two things in this verse. I'll save the second for the upcoming theological difficulty. So pay attention. Don't fall asleep yet. It's too early in my sermon. Now, my 12, you can fall asleep. I won't be, I won't be offended. But All right. Uh, the, this phrase here, not a hair from the head of any of you will perish. This is uh, a common Jewish expression. It's found three times in the Old Testament and uh, twice in the New. Uh, so uh, hair ostensibly being the most easily disturbed part of the body, uh, most easily detached. Uh, you'll see a number of my hairs have done so. Uh, that um, the idea is that God is able to preserve by arguing from the greater to the lesser. If he's able to preserve even one hair, he's certainly able to preserve your life. Uh, this is found in, if you're taking notes, 1 Samuel 14, where uh, the people rescue Jonathan from Saul's rash uh, threat. He says, if anybody eats food here while I'm pursuing my enemies, then uh, they're going to be put to death. And Jonathan, you remember, sticks the end of his staff into the honey and tastes some of it. And Paul says, I'm going to kill my son. I'm going to kill Jonathan. And people say, no, no, not a hair will fall from his head. It's found in 2 Samuel uh, 14 with Samuel and Saul, and then it's found again in 1 Kings 1 with um, Adonijah, when he misbehaves and decides to take the throne for himself and is distressed to find out that Solomon has been uh, anointed king. Instead, uh, he runs and, puts, and grabs hold of the horns of the altar so Solomon doesn't put him to death. And Solomon says, well, if he's a worthy man, not a hair will fall from his head. But of course, a chapter later, he's executed. <laughs> so it didn't work out so well for Adonijah. And again in Luke, 21 verse 18 Jesus uses that phrase uh, when he promises that his disciples will not lose even a hair of their head in the Olivet Discourse so it's a common phrase all right um having said this verse 35 he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all and broke it and began to eat so Paul here is leading by example having encouraged them to take food he does it himself and leads by example, verse 36, they are all thus encouraged, and they themselves take food. Luke uh, lists the number of persons on the ship at uh, 276. There are two manuscripts that have a different reading that say about 76, uh, but for a variety of reasons, uh, they are not to be preferred. And uh, it's not unreasonable, scholars tell us, for a ship uh, to have this number of people in that day. Uh, Josephus uh, writes, that on uh, an occasion he was uh, shipwrecked himself with a ship that held 600 passengers and only 28 escaped. And so uh, it's not uncommon for a ship to have this many people on it. And so in verse 38, uh, they reason that uh, lightening the ship is the correct course of action here, so they throw the expensive cargo into the sea. Now, what possible theological problem could there be lurking in our text this morning? Well, some of you who are familiar with your New Testaments might have recognized that there is some peculiar verbiage in verse 35. It does sound oddly familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> he took bread gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and broke it, began to eat. So scholars who meander through this text 
have different ideas about what's going on here. So one way to uh, put you on tinter hooks is to ask the question, is it a coincidence, just random coincidence, that Luke here uses the same language in verse 35 that we find in not one, but two other places, perhaps three, not counting parallel passages, at least two other places in the Gospels with the earthly ministry of Jesus. Namely, the feeding of the 4,000, which you know is a distinct event from the feeding of the 5,000, and the institution of the Lord's Supper. Is it merely coincidence? In fact, the coincidence is so strong that when you to get into the weeds of it, it's the exact same verbiage that's not only found in Luke's parallel passages, right, from our familiar author of the book, but it's the same verbiage copied verbatim by Matthew and by Mark and by John in chapter 6, which has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, but is this lengthy discussion of theological reflection on the feeding of the uh, second one, which is feeding of the 4,000. Is it, is it coincidence? Is it just a big coincidence that you have the same language? What's going on here? Well, some of our fellow evangelical Christians in different traditions will say, yes, it is just a coincidence. Now, I will point out that some of our evangelical friends who will remain nameless protect the guilty, see a lot of these coincidences in the Bible. Connections between the Old Testament and the New Testament are coincidences. Places where the New Testament quotes the Old Testament are coincidences. Places where certain theological ideas are pictured in memorable ways and seem to come up again, those are just coincidences. And all of you Silly confessional Protestants, Lutherans particularly, and Presbyterians and Anglicans who have one foot over in Rome anyway and can't be trusted. You just you just see a bunch of all you just see all these things there that are not there. It's not in my notes, but do you remember uh, back in the 70s and 80s there was a popular artist whose name I don't know who would draw these landscapes and people would put them on their walls and you walk by and you, at first brush, it's just a landscape with lots of, it's, it's a drawing, so there's lots of detail going on. And it's, but only as you begin to look at it longer, do you see that the artist has hidden images in the rocks and the trees. Do you know what I'm talking about? No? None of you know what I'm talking about. Oh dear. Well, in any case, it's sort of like that. Now, I happen to cast my lot with our fuddy-duddy Lutheran brothers and Anglican brothers who can't be trusted, and the overwhelming majority of those in the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition who don't think that anything is a coincidence. It's all significant. Every word of scripture is significant. Every detail is significant. So the question is, why is it significant that Paul is breaking bread, giving thanks to God in the presence of all, taking bread, breaking it, and distributing it? Is that significant? My answer is yes. And is there a deliberate echo of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and of Jesus offering the Lord's Supper? Well, I just happen to have here in my handy-dandy stack of things, some of you may know who was famous for talking about his stack. I don't see a look of recognition on your eyes, so I won't mention Rush Limbaugh. 
All right. Here are the people who say no. No significance. Purely a coincidence. Over here are the people who say yes. Of course it's significant. Now, I won't read them all to you. This fellow here, whom I strongly suspect to be a dispensationalist, doesn't even address it. It's not even on his radar screen. What a surprise. You're supposed to laugh when I do that. Okay. <laughs> Howard Marshall, who taught at Aberdeen and identified as an evangelical Methodist, says, well, there's something there, but I'm not quite sure what it is. Now, a little more substantive, by which I mean a lot more substantive, is our good friend, Simon Kistemacher, good Dutch Reformed fellow who taught at Reformed Theological Seminary in Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> Spends quite a bit of time on this. And he argues, I think convincingly, that there are four good reasons why we should not say that whatever Paul did in Acts 27 is the same as what we call the Lord's Supper or others in various traditions call the Eucharist, which is simply taken from the Greek word to give thanks. He cites four arguments, which I will summarize and keep open here in case my memory fails me. Number one, we only have one element, right? We have the element of the bread, but we do not have the element of the wine or the cup of unfermented grape juice thanks to Mr. Welch and his Methodist cronies <laughs> who benefited from banishing fermented wine from the Lord's table, but I digress. Number two, oh, by the way, wine and cup are terms that are not even found in the entire book of Acts. Can't find it in there. So that's the first argument. Number two, this is not in the context of a worship service. So whatever your Protestant flavor you have to agree that the Lord's Supper is properly observed in the context of the corporate body assembled for worship. And if you are a Presbyterian, you would say that, that the administration of the Lord's Supper is not valid unless it is also accompanied by and subsequent to some ministry of the word whether it's public preaching or exhortation or teaching or even, if you want to be bare bones about it, some devotional, right? There has to be some ministry of the word accompanying the sacrament. Okay. So that's argument number two. It's not a worship service. Argument number three. In Kistemacher's view, Paul would never have observed the Lord's Supper in the presence of unbelievers. All right? So following the logic of the proper setting of the Lord's Supper, being in the context of the church, whatever that is, ha-ha, he would not have done it in the presence of unbelievers. All right? And argument number four, which escapes me here. Let's see here. Oops. Did I take that thing out? Uh, let's see. Argument number four. Oh, yes. Uh, in his discussion of the Lord's Supper in Acts at 1 Corinthians 11, Paul makes a distinction between bread that is to be consumed for the purpose of satisfying hunger and bread that is consumed the Lord's, at the Lord's table. You remember, he says, if I paraphrase, what? Do you not have houses in which you can eat and drink? One takes his fill and the other goes hungry. So Paul implies that the purpose of whatever you call this is not primarily to satisfy hunger, but rather it has primarily what you might call a spiritual significance, a religious significance, an ecclesiastical significance. Right? So those are Kistmacher's arguments. Now, I find those persuasive. So if you're interested, I do not believe that we can properly say that what Paul did in Acts 27 is the Lord's Supper. But I haven't gotten to these arguments yet, have I? I haven't explained the coincidence. So if that's the case, and I do think it is, why... Is there such a strong parallel? Why is there such a clear echo of the feeding of the 5,000 and the institution of the Lord's Supper in Luke's language? Speculation number one. Our good friend Frederick Fivey Bruce, 
his middle name, F.F. Bruce, his middle name was a good Scottish name, Fivey, F-Y-B-I-E. Won't find that on many birth certificates today. <laughs> Mr. Bruce, Dr. Bruce, taught at Manchester. He's with the Lord now. But Dr. Bruce speculated that while there was a distinction between what the unbelievers in the room perceived and what the believers who were with Paul understood, that it nevertheless was, in his opinion, done with what he calls, quote-unquote, Eucharistic intent, which means that, in Mr. Bruce's opinion, Paul realized that the only people on the ship who would get it were his traveling companions, Luke and Aristarchus. Nevertheless, he is participating in a meal that his traveling companions, being Christians, would have understood as echoing the Lord's Supper. And that's why Luke writes the way he does. Now, I don't find that argument entirely satisfying, but I will give the last word to my seminary professor, William Larkin, who was also ordained in our denomination. And despite having the misfortune of going to a seminary that was not reformed in any way, there were nevertheless three of my professors who were ordained to my denomination, our denomination, and they all held the, the, the keys of power, if you will. Two of them were New Testament and Greek professors, and the third was systematic theology. And I tell you, you did not get through Igo Hodge's class without being confronted with the doctrines of grace and their implications. I will give him the last word out of respect to him, and I'm sure you all will enjoy meeting him someday. He's with the Lord now. He was a delightful fellow. He was, well, all right. Um, he argues, quote, we should not doubt that Luke wants us to understand that Paul eats here with Eucharistic intent. Multiple proof texts. Originally, the words of institution, I'll skip that part. Uh, Paul may have been doing this here, that is, echoing the Lord's Supper. But to what effect? This is the climax of Luke's acted parable. Now, try to get that silly dispensational historical grammatical hermeneutic out of your mind and for a moment consider that the Holy Spirit might possibly have put something in the New Testament that you might not, might not find immediately apparent. And in so doing, you will follow in the great footsteps of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Jonathan Edwards, those intellectual midgets. <laughs> and he says, this is an acted parable. And what does that mean? What it means is that Luke is presenting Paul here as something of an object lesson. He, his actions on the ship heretofore, as well as in this passage, are a sense an acted parable. Okay? Notice, well, I'll let him do the speaking. All right? He writes, in which physical salvation by divine providence mediated by the wisdom and guidance of God's apostle, points to the spiritual salvation of which this apostle was also a messenger. All right, let me translate that for you. Notice, is it just a coincidence? It's just a coincidence that Paul here on the ship guides the passengers to physical salvation. And isn't it interesting that Luke, now it's not rendered that way in most of your translations, but in verse 34, when Paul says, this is necessary for your preservation, the word there in Greek is actually translated in other contexts as salvation. <laughs> this is necessary for your salvation. All right. Isn't it interesting that there's a parallel between the way Paul conducts himself on the ship to lead these people to a physical salvation by resting on the special message given to him by the angel that says, None of you will lose your lives because it's necessary for Paul to appear before Caesar. And so because of that, they trust in him as the one who's the messenger, the divine messenger. And he guides them to physical preservation. And then it culminates with the celebration of a joint meal in which the words of institution are, I believe, deliberately transplanted from the Synoptic Gospels and the feeding of the 5,000. And it, it's, some, it's culminated in a meal. Isn't that the same pattern that we see in the feeding of the 5,000? Is the purpose of the feeding of the 5,000 to save the souls of the people in the group? No. Is the purpose of the feeding of the 5,000 to 
get them to see that Christ is the source of their earthly sustenance in that event, and therefore that he might possibly be the source of something greater than that? Yes. And so Larkin here is arguing this is an acted parable. It's not intended to be, strictly speaking, the Lord's Supper, but it points to the same thing. That just as Paul, exercising leadership in a practical, earthly way on this ship, is guiding them to physical salvation, isn't it a coincidence that Paul, using his office as an apostle, is also the one who leads his hearers to spiritual salvation by embracing the gospel? Isn't that a coincidence? Ding, 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 ding. All right. So, if you disagree with Dr. Larkin, God bless you. Maybe it's all just a big coincidence. But isn't it interesting that all through the Old Testament, God gives his people physical, earthly types, shadows, pictures, hints, foreshadowings of spiritual realities that are brought to bear in the New Testament. And isn't it a coincidence that when they eat bread in the wilderness, that Jesus says, I am the bread that came down from heaven? Isn't it a coincidence that when they drink water from the rock, which should not normally have water in it, that Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that the rock which followed them was Christ, and that Jesus says, whoever comes to me, out of him will flow rivers of living water. I'm sure that's just another coincidence, right? Isn't it a coincidence that when Moses puts a serpent, a bronze serpent, on a staff, and the people look to it, they're saved from their earthly, temporal affliction, and then Jesus, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in John's Gospel says, just as the serpent was raised in the wilderness by Moses, so will the Son of Man be raised from the earth. So, on the cross, right? So that those who look to him in faith will be saved from their spiritual. <clears throat> so, I will, without naming names, or movements, or traditions, or camps, or schools of thought, I will say that an overwhelming majority of evangelicals read this, and it just goes over their head. And they need to read more Martin Luther. They need to read more John Calvin. So there is your theological conundrum, which I hope to have elucidated for you. All right. Now, some observations about Paul. Now, I've told you before, I do often make use of other sources, not only commentaries, but I make an effort to listen to what I hope will be good preaching by other pastors, more gifted than I. This past week, I listened to a sermon on this very text by another PCA pastor at a church in South Florida. And this pastor made one observation of this text that I will bring to you and give credit to him. This pastor pointed out that above all, in this text, Paul is useful. Paul is useful. In Acts chapter 27, Paul says a series of things that are practically useful. He tells them, don't leave the fair havens. Something bad will happen. They don't follow his advice and something bad happens. Paul tells them, unless these sailors stay on the ship, you can't survive. He literally says, you can't be saved. Isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament we have a ship that goes through the water and a certain apostle, who shall remain nameless, Peter, mentions somewhere in his epistles, 1 Peter chapter 3, that there's an analogy between the ark and baptism, which he says now saves you, whatever that means. That just as the ark was brought safely through water, that those who in Christ are brought safely through the waters of baptism are saved. Now, while your mind is exploding, <laughs> lest you think I have become a Lutheran, which I'm not quite there yet, 
God bless them. There is a close connection between baptism and salvation, which we can elucidate later, delineate later. But the point is that there's a parallel. And isn't it interesting that just as Jonah was on a ship with unbelievers and ran into a storm, and they made a decision regarding Jonah that saved them in an earthly way, took his advice, which involved throwing him off the ship. <laughs> then in the same way, Paul here is on a ship with unbelievers going through storms, and by following what he says, they're spared. I'm sure that's a coincidence too. Just as Jesus said, just as Jonah was in the heart of the earth for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days. That's a coincidence too, right? Just a coincidence. All right. Paul is useful. He tells them things to do that lead to their salvation. Notice that Paul feels responsibility for those around him. Paul could have sat in a corner and let the ship go down, but he didn't. Paul took initiative to encourage those around him with God's promise. Remember, he tells them about the angel who promises him they'll all be saved. Paul did not work to impress those around him with his spiritual practices, but neither did he hide his faith. So he gives thanks to God in the presence of all. Now, I will let you decide whether or not you and your friend having lunch in a public restaurant and praying out loud over your food is a pharisaical practice of standing on the street corner and praying so that all men will say well, good things about you, or whether you are following the example of following the footsteps of Paul, who did not hide his faith in front of the unbelievers on the ship and publicly gave thanks to God for his food. But he didn't hide his faith. Paul also led others by his example of faith and his gratitude to God. So if my professor, Dr. Larkin's, theory is correct, that this is an acted parable, Paul didn't Paul exercise leadership by saying, I'm giving thanks to my God, by the way, the God who's going to save all of you, and you might do well to do the same. Even unbelievers are not insignificant to God. I mentioned Jonah earlier. At the end of Jonah, you remember in chapter 4, verse 11, God rebukes Jonah for his eagerness to see Nineveh get it by saying, shouldn't I have compassion? Look, Jonah, you had compassion on this plant, which served your purposes, but shouldn't I have compassion on this great city of Nineveh, which has 120,000 people in it? Does the Bible tell us that all 120,000 souls in Nineveh came to a saving knowledge of Christ because they repented? The text doesn't tell us that, but God's concerned with them is God concerned with the, I don't know, 40,000 people who live in Alamogordo? Is God concerned with the people who live in Bangkok, the center of the world's sex trade? Doesn't say that they're all going to be saved. I'm not a universalist. I don't believe everyone goes to heaven. But God's concerned about them, isn't he? I think that's the reason why Luke tells us that there's 276 people on board. Now, commentators will say, well, they needed to know the exact number of people so they could distribute the food. Okay. Another commentator says, well, they knew the exact number. They needed to know the exact number of people so they knew how many people a ship could hold. Well, okay. There was a manifest that had all the names on it. Okay. I'm of the opinion Luke records that to show us that God is concerned with 276 souls on the ship, even if they're pagans. He's concerned about them. He knows about them. Human lives made in the image of God are more important than money. That's why in verse 38, they throw the wheat overboard. The entire reason this ship existed was to transport grain from Alexandria, presumably. It's called an Adametrian ship earlier in the text, but those are ships that are transporting. There's an entire fleet. Remember, I told you the Romans have devoted to the transport of grain from Alexandria to Rome. It was the lifeline of Rome. If that lifeline were cut, if all the ships bringing grain from uh, Alexandria stopped going to Rome, the Roman the Rome would fall. <laughs> it would fall into famine, right? And yet, 
the human lives on that ship were more important than the money because if they didn't survive, the grain, the grain wouldn't get there anyway. Now, the text doesn't tell us that Paul specifically admonished them to throw the wheat overboard. But it is interesting that they all in, intuitively recognize that their lives are worth more than the cargo. In the same way, our interactions with unbelievers should not be avoid, devoid of practical help. When we interact with people who do not profess faith in Christ, we are still to offer them practical, earthly help. Now, Paul here is not randomly handing out checks, right? He's not randomly handing out money, but he does offer practical assistance. I've always remembered, for some reason, a lunch that I had when I was a senior in college with a campus minister who I didn't know very well, but I had friends who were involved in his campus fellowship, and it was associated with the Church of the Nazarene. Now, I understand our town has one of these up on Scenic. I've never met the pastor, but um, it's a different tradition than what we have, and we have theological differences with them. But I, I'll never forget, his name was Pastor Burdett. We were at a pizza hut, and he figured out that the the something needed to be fixed on the toilet. And so he offered, the, somehow it came to his attention, he had not gone back there, but someone mentioned it to him and, and he had been a plumber. He, was, he, had, he knew plumbing, he had been a plumber. And so he went back and just fixed it himself. And I thought, well, that's just a very practical thing to do. You know, just help, help the restaurant out with their, their plumbing problem. But when we involve other, when we interact with other people, we give them counseling, perhaps, which might have very practical wisdom. We might fix something at their house. We might fix their car, and I sadly am unable to do any of those things. <laughs> but we might be able to help them with, I don't know, something in their life that needs to be fixed, something in their life that needs to be done. I believe God calls us as Christians to have practical use in the world. We should be willing to exercise leadership with unbelievers as God gives us ability and opportunity for the purpose of making God's grace practical and credible. Now, it's already past 12, so I won't proof text everything, but just follow with me briefly. Joseph, right? Practical wisdom with unbelievers. Right? We're told that he, in a sense, saved Egypt through his wisdom and administration. Esther and Mordecai, right? They're in a pagan court, and yet through their wisdom, the Jewish nation is saved. And Mordecai is rewarded for it by being made a high official. How about 2 Kings chapter 5? The little girl from Israel who waited on Naaman's wife. Remember, she's the one, she's not even named in scripture, but she's the one who tells her uh, mistress, what would the term be? Well, I wish that the prophet from Samaria could see my master because he would heal him of his leprosy. Remember? And so she's the reason that Naaman goes to see Elisha. And he's healed. Is that practical? Is it practical to be healed of leprosy? Right? Notice how many of the miracles in the Bible, Old Testament as well as New, are very practical. You think it's practical to be healed? You think it's practical to be raised from the dead? <laughs> That's beneficial, I would say. God doesn't do miracles. I mentioned this when I went through Mark. He, he doesn't commend Christ in the gospel by doing random miracles like David Copperfield. And now, to prove I'm the Messiah, I'm going to make the Statue of Liberty disappear. <laughs> he does it with miracles that help people. Mm -hmm. He does it with miracles that help people. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you not have, are you and your son going to die from starvation? Elisha says, well, let me help you. Get some jars together, and I'll just 
something's just going to happen behind the scenes here, and we're just going to fill up all the jars, and you can use that and sell. It's practical. Elisha, this axe head has sunk because it was borrowed. I'll just make the axe head float. That's practical. <laughs> okay, now you and I can't make axe heads float, all right? But it was practical. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Practical? Why are they there? They're there because they're smart. That's the whole reason that Nebuchadnezzar wanted to get the cream of the crop, the best educated, the blue bloods. He wanted to get them to work for him because they were useful. We're told in Daniel chapter 1, they were very smart, and so they were useful. Do you think Daniel was useful? <laughs> Nehemiah. How about Philippians 4, verse 22? Those, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. <laughs> Do you think those in Caesar's household were useful? They're believers, right? How about Erastus, the city treasurer of Corinth? Romans chapter 16, verse 23. Erastus greets you, the city treasurer. Do you think he was useful? Do you think the city of Corinth would have employed him as the treasurer of their city if he were not useful? And here he is, a believer. How about Zenos the lawyer? Titus chapter 3, verse 13. Greet Apollos and Zenos the lawyer. You think Zenos was useful? How about Luke as the physician? All right, now don't turn there because time is, I can tell your attention span is waning. So I'm just going to read a couple of verses. How about from Titus? Now, one of the themes of Titus is that uh, Paul wants to see the gospel transform the culture of the Cretans. Remember? And he prefaces his comments by saying, one of their own prophets has said, all Cretans are liars. <laughs> right? Evil beasts and lazy gluttons. And Paul says, don't believe any of that. No, he said, no, he says, this testimony is true. Therefore, exhort them, re reprove them severely that they may be sound in the faith. In other words, if the gospel is going to take root and be credible in Cretan society, the people who profess to be believers are to be different than the Cretans around them. Isn't it interesting that today, some 2,000 years later, we still refer to people who are exceptionally depraved as Cretans, right? Titus, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. They, these false teachers, profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. In other words, one of the problems with false teachers is that they're not useful for anything good. How about chapter 2? Titus 2, verse, picking up in verse 11. Titus 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, wonderful proof text there for Christ's divinity, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Now, if you are of a certain age, it may be stuck in your mind that the only thing useful about good deeds is that they make you look like a Boy Scout, right? Wasn't it always the Boy Scout who helped the little old lady across the street? And it was a good deed, right? You do a good deed for the day, you check off your box, right? But Christians are to be characterized by good deeds and not just good deeds done by a monk somewhere in the desert with crazy vows of asceticism, but good deeds that are helpful to people, practical, earthly, useful. If you are a Christian, God wants you to be useful to other people, even unbelievers, because maybe the unbelievers will see that you are useful and think, gee, that person is useful and is characterized by good deeds. Maybe he has something to offer, like the gospel. All right. How about Titus chapter 3, verse 1? Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good 
deed. Verse 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, lest you think that Paul is teaching salvation by works, which he is not, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we're not saved by deeds, but go down to verse 8. This is a trustworthy statement concerning these things. I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Useful. Good deeds. God wants you to do good deeds and be useful. To be saved by them? Of course not. But to be useful. All right? Finally, verse 14 the last thing, almost the last thing Paul says in this letter, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Get it out of your head that good deeds require you to subscribe to justification through works. You were not saved through works. You were never saved through works. No one in the Bible was saved through works. Or well, saved through Christ's works, but that's another sermon. You were not saved by good works. But God wants you to do good works. He wants you to be have good deeds that are useful. All right? Now, I'm being pedantic like this, tongue-in-cheek, because I'm trying to offset with my humor the idea that if Christians make an effort to be useful, that somehow they're legalists. All right? God doesn't want you to be a legalist. He doesn't want you to be a Pharisee. He doesn't want you to think that you're a good person because you do good deeds. You are not a good person. You are a depraved sinner who is justified by grace alone through faith alone. Just as I am. Okay? But God wants us to be useful. Paul was useful. Paul had practical, everyday things that he did that helped people. And when he helped people, it also demonstrated to them that his message might be worthwhile which is that you can't be saved by works. Someone else had to save you. Mm -hmm. All right. You join me in prayer. Lord, help us, we pray, to glorify Christ by helping others around us, even unbelievers. In Jesus' name, amen.